They put me on the train, kept handcuffs on me, and took off the handcuffs and everything in front of everybody so everybody could see me. And I felt so bad. I felt like, man, is this real? And guess what? Once they did it, everybody looking at me. Who is this? Like, I'm a serial killer. My son was always in my head, but I was like, man, the streets is calling me. I was still in it. Then I kept saying, man, this is my story. And I always want my story just to inspire somebody else. I want people to know redemption is real, man. You could come back. You could redeem yourself. I want people to know the biggest thing is this. Meet people where they are without judging them, not talking it down on them. Do a lot of listening, not a lot of talking. When you grew up in the south side of Chicago, your parents were together, right? Yes. Your mom was taking care of you and your two siblings. You were the baby of the yes. family. Your dad yes. was uh, in a gang. So yes. my question to you is, I know you were only three years old when he went away, but you did visit him, you know, in hour long blocks over those next several years when he, when he went to jail. In prison, yes. So in your earlier years, right, what life lessons did you remember your dad, the gang member, the convict? teaching you as a young person? Was he trying to persuade you not to get involved or to stay, you know, shoot straight? Or what, 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 what do you remember from him at that time? I remember one, one saying he always had told me, and I remember that I use all the time. He say, everything goes on in your mind and got to come out your mouth. Always think, you know what I'm saying? Don't just say this, but also, I remember this, like like you say, my father was in a, a gang, street organization, and I wanted to be like him. But at a young age, what my father used to tell me, it's okay to be a part of that because he is a black disciple, right? So he used to tell me this, Kobe, son, Jesus was a disciple. <laughs> so it's okay. This is something I'll never forget. You know what I'm saying? So this is something my father used to tell me. So uh, at a young age, I used to uh, remember that. So, you know, so much. But coming home, even like, so even when me going to prison to see him, right, going to, be, to visit him, his friends would be in the visit room teaching me how to throw up the game signs on visits. So remember, I'm a kid now. And I still got pictures and everything to show all that. But, you know, they're teaching me that. So, growing up, I thought that was always cool, though. You know, I thought it was always cool. So, that's what I saw, you know, at the early age. I remember at the early age, like my father was selling, you know, drugs. I could be in the car with him. And he'll tell me, huh, hold this, son, hold this. Hold this at a young age. Hold this, because he say, if the police pull us over, they ain't going to search you, your kid. So I remember things like that. So, like I say, my father was my hero. And growing up, that's who I wanted to be like. I wanted to be like him. And nobody could tell me nothing different. And guess what? All my life I knew right for wrong. But I still chose to go this route. Now I look back at it, it's like this what all I seen right there. It seemed it cool. My father in Cadillac cars, big big hats, tailor-made suits, mink coats, and, you know, looking all fly and all that. So I wanted to be like my father. And then your grandmother, who you were close with, is that your dad's mom or was that your mom's mom? No, my mother mom. Okay. My so mother. talk about talk about that relationship. What did, what did you learn from her that was in contrast to what you were seeing with your father and learning from your mother? So my grandmother and my grandfather... I, that's who I learned from them. I learned a lot because both of them was together and my grandfather was a hardworking man and all that. And I remember my grandmother always had a business, a lounge. And you saw that in the documentary, the Interrupter. She always had a business. So that was her lounge but that I you guys were all dancing in. That was hers. Okay. Yes, that was my grandmother's lounge. And that's like her third one. So growing up as a kid, she always had a lounge. And I remember she used to pay me to clean up and sweep and mop, you know, different things like that. 
and the lamb stock stock beer and different things like that. But my grandfather used to always come home for work. And when he come home, payday was Thursday. Hmm. He just gave my grandmother the whole check. Take care of all the bills, do this and do that. He didn't keep none of the money. He'll just give it to my grandmama. So my grandparents was always telling me to stop. My grandmother stayed on me. Stop hanging on the corner. Stop hanging with them boys. Stop doing this and that. And my grandfather, I used to see him going to work every day and provide for the house. And on the weekends, all my cousins, all of us used to sleep over grandma's house. It'd be like 12 or 13 of us in the front room and under the table and everywhere, you know, every weekend. And so she was teaching you discipline by having you work and sweep up in the in the lounge? Yeah, and she used to always stay on me about being on the corner and being out and telling me to come in the house at a decent time and, you know, who not to hang with. You know, don't hang around them crew, them groups and the guys and all that. She had just in my ear and um, always was reminding me anything I need come to her. You know, because like I said at that time, my father, he was back and forth. He was in jail, but he was probably dead at this time. And my mother... She was doing the best she can to raise us, but she was using drugs, you know what I'm saying, at that time. So I was always hanging on my grandmother in our house, my grandmother. Okay. So you said two two violent events occurred during your childhood that basically defined your childhood. One was the one that sent your dad to prison. One was what happened when he got out. Can you talk a little bit about those two events? Yeah, so um, as a kid, so... um. When I first heard about um, my daddy, my uncle, and them, they used to always share me what sent him to prison, right? So they say they outside the lounge, and people came in there just shooting and shooting and shooting at every shooting at everybody and shooting at him. He happened to have a gun on him, so he ended up getting charged self defense because people came in there shooting, but he had a gun. He shot it, and the guy died. So um, I used to hear that so much. I'm talking about from my uncles and hit my father's friends on the block in the neighborhood. Like, man, Rick, they used to call him Superfly, like the movie Superfly, Silky Smooth, Slick Rick. Man, he wasn't nothing to play with. So I'm hearing all this stuff. You know, I'm like, man. And I'm seeing pictures and him with, you know, like I say, suits and hats and all that. I'm like, man, okay, okay. I want to be like him. That's my role model. So that piece before he, you know what I'm saying? Uh, that's the piece I saw him when he came home, the little time I was able, you know, to spend time with him. But I'm hearing all these stories before he went to prison. Like, man, Rick wasn't nothing to play with. He wasn't no joke and different things like that. So hearing that, then seeing that piece, it's like, then I see myself following his footsteps, right? When I say follow his footsteps, I end up going to prison and all that. And I remember this like yesterday where I was going to prison and then people, I went the first place I went to this place called um, Galesburg. And you know how you come like, I mean, you don't know what I'm saying, you and receiving, you know, like I'm getting processed in. And I cut looking at this dude. Man, he looked familiar. You know what I'm saying? This is how I'm looking. He's an old timer. So I had the chance to talk to him because he worked in the um, up front, like when you first get off the bus and, you know, help you get a situated. I say, man, what's your name? He told me his name. I say, you know Rick? Yeah, I know Rick. Rick? Because his real name, Arthur Hoover Jones. He said, Arthur Hoover Jones? I say, my daddy, Rick, I'll say my name. I'm his son, Kobe. What? You Rick's son? They embraced me right away. You all, you know what I'm saying, moving the land up for me, give me special prayers, and while I'm in the penitentiary, I'm a shorty. I'm saying I'm young. It's like, oh, Rick's all down here, man. They they embraced me and made sure I was super cool and different things like that. So I'm like, my mom and them, when I was called, they say, you straight because everybody know you down there and different things like that. So I felt the pride. You know what I mean? I felt some type of way like, yeah, yeah, I'm Rick, son, you know, and all that. 
Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below. And that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. You, you went to prison um, after being involved in the shootout, even though you didn't have a gun, right? Is that what put you in prison? Yeah, I went to prison about three or four times. Okay, though. but that was the last time. Yeah. This... Oh, the last time I went to prison, my last time was incarcerated was a possession case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was that the case where you didn't have a gun though, but they were they were charging you with possession? Yeah, a few times. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's yes, two incidents like that. So how much time total did you spend in prison? So I did like 10 to about 11 to 12 years, like not straight, you know, three, four years here, three years, you right. know, it was split up. And you mentioned in the book that RICO charges is what the prosecutors normally use to target gang members. So can you, for the audience who's never heard of RICO, what is, what does that mean? And how does it target gang members? Yeah, a lot of times it's um, RICO charges, like, say if they called it like criminal enterprising, like um, few people selling drugs or doing whatever they're doing, that's how they bring everybody in. It's like a RICO charge, more like a conspiracy charge, you know, the, um, a bigger indictment so they can have multiple people charged with the exact same thing. So a lot of times, you know, when they be at people, that's how they do it. You know, it's, uh, figure they could just snatch everybody up like that. And talk about the moment where you decided to turn things around. I think it was involving your three-year-old, it was involving Latrell. Yeah, my son in Latrell, where it was really, uh, so I remember I was in the county jail going back and forth to court because that's, you know, like receiving, period. And uh, my son was just born. I probably saw him one time. So when, when I saw him again, it's probably been a few years. So I'm coming out of the back, out of the lockup, handcuffed, shackled up. My son, my son, mother, my sister, and my mom all in court, you know, coming to court for me. So as I'm coming out, I'm, I see him right away. He laid eyes on me. I'm like, dad, 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 you know. And he comes, he, daddy, daddy. And the judge realized that we didn't see each other. He could see, you know, how emotional I got and all that. He had told the bailer, I never saw nothing like that. Take the handcuffs off of him. He let me embrace my son, hug him and all that. I'm so happy. And, you know, everybody, it's like in front of the whole, you know, everybody in the courtroom. And the judge was nice to do that. And um, I know... After I had the case, because I knew I wasn't finna get out. So I knew I had to go back to lockup. As I'm going back to lockup, my son turned around and I turned around. Because I told my son, go see your mama. She calling you all the time. She wasn't calling him. But I know I got to go this way. He going out that door. So I had him tell him to go that way. And what's quick, he turned around. He just broke down in front of the whole courtroom. I want my daddy. I want my daddy. I want my daddy. So I just got so emotional. I just got towed down, tears coming out my eyes. I'm like, man, man, I need to be there for my son. So all I'm thinking about is I'm going to go back to lockup and I hope nobody don't say nothing to me crazy. Because, you know, tears coming down and you crying, you don't want to feel some type of way. You know what I'm saying? When you in that setting, people crack jokes, they make fun, or they might say something crazy. You know, and um, I was like, man, I ain't trying to go there, but I will if I had to. So right there, I really start thinking then. I ain't going to just say that just helped me. I mean, um, that made me do make that change right then. But it's like, man, oh, my man. So um, right there. And then, like the street organization I was a part of, the Black Disciples, and I talked about it, but the founder other organization, the one introduced me to ceasefire at time. It's called Cure Violence Global now. But the founder, the one introduced me to it. So once he um 
say, man, Kobe, man, you need to do something different. He had just came home because he had 28 years and all that. Say, man, we need to do something different and stay out here. So I started volunteering for six party then and different things like that. I got laid off three or four times, you know, about three, two or three times because funding issues and all that. And I say, man, I ain't going back to jail, man. I'm going to just do what I got to do, man, to stay out here. So when you got out of jail, did you get early release or you did all your time? You good no, I did all my time. You did all your time. Just did all my time. Okay. Yeah. Now, how did you stay out of trouble in jail? How did I, st how did I stay out of trouble? Well, assuming jail so can, a lot of times, you know, you can be... No, as a, it ain't. As a, I would stay out of the gang trouble, member. Though. You you can sometimes be you know tapped to do things to people or protect you. You're a part of the gang in prison, and obviously you can end up extending your time. How did you stay out of that trouble? Did you change in prison and just tell the guys, "Hey, no. I ain't gonna sit up here and tell y'all change in prison because I was gang banging in prison." Okay, you know we we fight. You in guys prison. ran we the prison basically. I mean, I had a big say, so yes. So I'm in there fighting in prison and um, we gang banging in prison, really. You know, fighting different groups and cliques and all type of stuff going on. Rides, jumping off and all type of things was taking place in prison. So that piece, um, it wasn't that I, I ain't gonna say, say I changed while I was in prison because I was still, you know, calling the shots in prison. So... You know, it went all the way changed. But you were still thinking about your son in the back of your mind. Like, I got to get back to my Yeah, kids. I'm thinking about my son. My family. Yeah, but at that time, but I think, but I'm thinking, but I think I had got out and came back, though. Remember, I said I went three or four times, though. So when I think about my son, that's younger years. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about when he was young, young. But I ended up going back probably twice after that, though. You know what I'm saying? So it had to be something like that. So I ended up going back twice. So my son was always in my head, but I was like, man, the streets is calling me. I mean, I, I mean, I was still in it. Cause one thing we always feel like coming from that environment, we always feel like we ain't going to get caught. That's be the mindset slickness. You know what I'm saying? You ain't going to get in trouble. You ain't going to get this, but, I was trying to still make sure my son was all right, but I still like, man. Well, here's the other thing. At the time, I feel like this all I When you get out of prison, it's very difficult. See, people don't realize when you get out of prison, it's very difficult to work a regular job because you got to say that you were incarcerated, you're a felon, et cetera. So you can only really get menial jobs. Meanwhile, you got two kids, you got a family, you got to support them. So did you try to to not be involved in street activity when you first got out of prison? And is that why you ended up going back again? Because you could do better? Yeah, I mean, I could do, um, first of all, it is hard when somebody get out of jail because every time you have to fill out the application, you're going back and forth. Should you lie and say you ain't never been incarcerated? Then let them catch it on their own. And that's be our mindset. Like, man, I ain't finna volunteer nothing. If they catch it, they catch it. If they don't, they don't. And I hate to say it like that. And a lot of times they caught it. So I'm like, man, then I'm like, man, what am I supposed to do? You know, or sometimes and all that. So you can't get a bank account. You can't get anything. You can't do nothing. And, and people don't understand. And I see it right now in real time. When brothers and sisters get an opportunity, when they first get out of prison, when they get an opportunity, when they first get out of prison, they could be really successful, though. And I'm saying the first 90, 60 to 90 days. After 90 days, they could get lost in the sauce real quick. And I see that right now. I saw people change when they first got out. But they could get lost in the sauce real quick. And people don't, um, sometimes people understand. That's why I say that redemption piece is real, man. It's like, Giving brothers and sisters an opportunity, you know, that's, that's, man, that's real. Because it determines them what way, what direction they don't finna go. Guess what? Some people come home, they ain't got no family left. They passed in prison, they ain't got no mama, they ain't got no brother, they ain't got no sister, they ain't got no father. Or they did so much to family members, 
they don't want to have nothing to do to do with them. You know what I'm saying? Do with them. So it, it be it be hard. But the biggest thing is, after serving your time, man, people still look at you crazy, and it, it's crazy. And now I experience that. I don't know. I experience that when I when I was in prison and I got out of prison and went straight to Seattle, Washington. And once I went to Seattle. I'm on a Amtrak, Amtrak train. My auntie sent me a ticket. So I'm released. So they taking me, you know, to put me on the train, you know, from prison. I'm shackled up and handcuffed, but I'm released now. You hear me saying I'm free. They put me on the train, kept handcuffs on me, and took off the handcuffs and everything in front of everybody. So everybody could see me. And I felt so bad. I felt like, man, is this real? You know, I felt bad. And guess what? Once they did it, it's like everybody looking at me like, who is this? Like, I'm a serial right. killer. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I mean. It's on the like, train. They just put a serial killer on the train. Yeah. And and so it took me like 18 hours, two hours. I'm going to Seattle, Washington. Then I'm, I met this nice family from Portland. Cause you know Portland right before Seattle, this nice family. It's this this man, his his wife. He had two kids. He looked at me. He's like, man, bro, um, can we buy you lunch? Can we buy you dinner? You know what I'm saying? On a train and all that. But I was so happy. But everybody looking at me crazy and all that. I'm like, man, I just did my time. I'm happy to be out of here. But it just show you, man. Well. And I was so mad, too, because I was mad at the officers, the people, for doing me like that. And when everybody know I just got out, it was crazy, embarrassing. I, was, I felt some type of way. I'm happy that I'm out, but I still, yeah. like, really? So how, how did you, you said the, the, the ex-head of the gang got you involved in Cure Violence, yeah, the, the founder, they are the founder of the group, Mr. Freeman, Jerome Shorty Freeman. He has the founder leader. So how did he, he how, just, did, how did you guys connect and what did he have to say so, to you to sort of inspire you to, to get involved? So we've been connected because my father and him used to run together. So my father was a part of that same, you know, and his nephews and his nieces, all of us went to elementary school, grammar school together. So all of us grew up together. So. He know my family. I knew his family. We all, like, you know, family anyway. And he just used to just say, man, Kobe, what you don't do and all that, we need to do something different. And he'll just motivate me to do something different. And I just um, stayed consistent with it. I got laid off two or three times. How, how, how would he contact you, though? Would he, like, oh, email you? I was out before him. I was out before okay. him. I was out before him. When I knew he was home, I went to the house. And Going to see him and checking in with him and all that. Man, hey, welcome home. We happy to see you out here. And I was getting him the landscape of the land of the community. Like, man, I was motivating him too, right? You need to stay out here. You can't be doing this. You can't be doing that. He has asked me a lot of questions, and we are just talking. He was talking, and we just spent so much time together. And I was getting a lot of – he is like, grooming me, educate me on a lot of different things. And talking to me on the record. And he started, he started um, Cure Violence. He has a found, no, he has the founder of the, the group, the Black DC, right, right. the street organization. We so he was part. just working but with he didn't start Cure Violence. No, he wasn't even working with Cure Violence at that time. He yeah. just wanted to see peace in the community. He just wanted to see brothers and sisters come together. So he introduced me to it because... Put it like this. You're saying he was working. He really was working, but he wasn't working on the rocket files. He wouldn't get paid, but he was helping keeping up so keeping so much violence down in the community because who he was. So was this a paid position at Cure Violence? Oh, yes. When I started working, yes, yeah, it's a paid position at Cure Violence. And my job was like, a, when I first started, I was a violence interrupter. And my job was more like a fire fire. Like a, if a building burning down is blazing, the fireman come put out the blaze, right? Put out the fire. So my job is to dispute conflicts and mediate conflicts, conflict resolution, all that. So my job was to stop people from shooting, killing each other, 
when people is beefing with each other, it's my job to de-escalate these situations, talk people down and different things like that. And you have to be a credible messenger from the communities who people respect and different things like that. So you show up to work and part of the job is you guys, I thought, I saw the documentary. So, you know, you get a call, somebody's beefing on this corner. You guys hop in the car, you shoot over to that corner and then what? No, we shoot it. So keep in mind, the areas we are working at in these communities are areas we born and raised in. We from these areas. So we have the relationship. So we know what groups and cliques are over here. So when we go over there, so you already hey, know what's that's going on. We have the relationship. This already. is his other territory. Yeah. Yes, we already know that and we got relationships. Mm -hmm. And most of them areas we came from ourselves. So it's easy when you have no relationships and people know you and they know what you're doing every day to stop this madness. Okay. So you show up and then do, does, does everybody know you that do the, the kids on the corner, do they know who you are? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of them know me and I ain't going to sit up and just tell you everybody know me, but the ones who need to know me, know me. And a lot of them know me and the ones I don't know, I would get introduced them by other people who know them. So it's really just being out there in the community every day, building relationships. So say if I'm outside every day, walking the area, the target area, riding around the target area, it's going to be a lot of people I know. It's going to be a lot of people I don't know, but I'll be out there building relationships every day with other people I don't know. And the people I do know, they'll be introducing me to people I don't know. So talk about the first couple of times you did this, because now you're on the other side of things. And obviously, because I saw the documentary as well, you, you actually recruited other people to come out and be a part of that conversation and you saw them change. So what was your transformation like from doing this in theory to actually doing it in reality and seeing that how much of a difference you can make? I mean, to me, and, and I'm saying it in the most humblest way, um, it's like, it was easy to me though, right? And I'm saying that in a way because I'm from that community. It's like, I know the people. So doing the work is the easy part though. You know, where people know you, I'm credible. My name is good in the neighborhood. You know, people respect me. Uh, and they know I was sincere about the work. They know I was passionate, I was committed. And a lot of them know I used to be out there with them though. So they respect that. And, and Mr. Freeman used to always say, man, man, Kobe, man, people respect you. And I mean, how they respect me, that's how they respect you. So I was always good in the community where people respected me in a great way. You know what I'm saying? And I ain't saying respect me because I'm so much, some of them because of the past, but some of them because what I was doing for the community, though. It's almost like you were born for that position and then all of the experiences you had, the going in and out of jail, the watching your father get clubbed yeah. to death, the, to the watch your mom get hooked on drugs. I mean, it's like exposed you to almost everything that these other kids were experiencing everything. so it's, they could relate to you. And you didn't even have to say anything. Yeah. They could see in your eyes. And almost yeah. what you don't and say it, that he knows exactly what I'm going through. Right. Exactly. And the biggest thing is this. Meet people where they are without judging them, not talking to down on them. Do a lot of listening, not a lot of talking. Like, man, validate, man. I hear you, man. I hear you. Yep. You let them know you really hear them and you understand them. You ain't listening. You ain't you ain't spending them, right? You ain't um talking down on them. You ain't making no promises. You're not working to them. them. You're not, You're not hustling them. You're just them. there just holding no, space. Just, yeah, just there. Like, man, what's up? Guess what? We'll do a barbecue. We'll do a cookout, man. Bring your family over there, man. Let's do a basketball tournament. Let's do that. Guess what? I got some Chicago Bulls tickets. I want to bring you and the little homies with me to the basketball game. A lot of these guys never been off the block. So I'm showing them something different. Then I'm bringing other people around, you know, celebrity figures like, man, this such and such. This, you know, so it's all about building that relationship more than anything. That's all. So let's say someone's listening to this right now 
and they are related to somebody who's living that street life, right? And making like boneheaded decisions and they're trying to break through to them, but they can't. And you're obviously not, you know, you're where you are and maybe they're somewhere far away. Give us a playbook. Give us the, 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 the roadmap. How do you get through? How do you make any kind of difference in a young kid's um, mentality when, they're, when you see them going in the wrong direction? Right. So the first thing you got to do first, and I say this all the time, and I'm saying this, and I saw this, I've been doing it close to 20 years. The work we do is not for everybody. It's not. I know a lot of people passion. I know people care about this situation. You know, lost somebody to gun violence, but it take a special people, people, a group of people to really do this work. Cause some people got to know your approach. You got to know what to say and when to say it. You know what I'm saying? And you can't say the wrong thing and rub somebody the wrong way, but most important, you got to be yourself. And like I say, you can't be judgmental. You meet them, these guys, these guys, these women, where they are. So it's like coming out there saying, them, what's up? Showing them love. Like, man, what's up? What y'all got going on? You know, you just building relationships when you start off. You know, you just building relationships. They see, man, oh, what's up, man? What's Let them know, man, I'm here, man. If you need somebody to talk to, come talk to me. So it's all about that relationship piece. It's critical. And seeing you. You can't, and you can't make promises to these young people. If you say you don't do something and you don't do it, it tear your whole credibility down. Like, man, they full of it. So they ain't going to say Kobe full of it. They don't say ceasefire full of it. So a lot of times it's just really meeting where they at and uh, being understanding with them, not judging them and um, listen to them, listen to them. That's all you, you got to listen to them. You got to Go out, man, and just listen to them. You know, we call it babysitting, right? You spending so much time with them, like, right? and when situations happen, you talking them down, but you also changing their mindset, you changing their thinking, and you can't sometimes come off like this, man. I know what you're going through, cause you don't. You don't. You can make situations worse, worse than they are, and a lot of times this work is about psychology. You know, well. I tell people all the time, in this line of work, you got to be thinking on your feet at all times. Because people, they don't come this way, come that way, come this way, come that way. You know what I'm saying? The way I approach this situation, I ain't going to be able to approach that situation like that. I ain't going to be able to take that. So it's all of me, all that. And you, it's like a skill, though. Like, we do training, we do workshops and different things like that. But I really believe, you know, not saying in no cocky way, like you said earlier, I feel like this was for me. This like this what I supposed to be doing. You know, it's it's this work like this though. And connecting with people and all that. You know, connecting with people and meeting with it, man. I love this. It feel good when I used to jump on the highway or the and going home and people call me like, man, Kobe, man, stop. I'm thank you for saving our lives. Thank you for doing this. I felt like I was a hero. I really felt like I was a hero, but I don't look at it like that now. It's like, man, I'm just doing my job. But it feel good when you know you're making a difference in somebody else's life. It feel great. Also, when you're on the street, you you have to get good at reading people because that could be life or death if you don't understand what someone's intentions are in like a couple seconds. And I imagine being in prison accelerates that. So, yeah, yes, because yes, you got to watch their body language. Mm -hmm. Body language. I mean, you watch you watch their body language and the tone, yeah. and it's important. The words because I saw in the documentary when you were talking to what's his name who became the UPS driver later. The first time you interacted with him, you weren't really looking at him. You were kind of looking down, and you were talking very slowly, because he was really his energy was really high, and like he was yeah, he flame was looking for something to pop off, right? So I noticed that you you very carefully just kind of you you were not you were trying to to, to de-escalate the situation and maybe you weren't even aware that that's what you were doing but that's what it looked like when I saw it play out. Yeah, because I'm trying to see 
what I was trying to see what um what I'm a lot of times I try to size people up, right? And I'm trying to what strategy I'm gonna use to connect with them. Cause think about this. Sometimes like I just sit up and say you can say the wrong things to people and they mess things up. So I see one trying to hear this and that, but everybody get a soft bite, and I got to hit that soft bite. But I don't want to say nothing that's going to elevate, you know what I'm saying, that elevate him to go up. That's what, man, what about your kids? So it, when you hit somebody's kids, like, oh, whoa, whoa, some things, that you know what I'm saying? The whole thing is you get people to think. And again, you know what it feels like because you had that moment. You had that moment. Yes, of the yes, yes, yes. I, I definitely know what it feel like. I mean, it's like in real time. I understand that. So I don't want to, um, that's why, but I still don't want to throw it off. Like, man, I know what you're going through, but I really do know what you're going through, but I want to help him help me more where I could understand him more and he could be receptive of me more. When I've read about your story, right? I don't mean to pump you up like this, but it 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 resembles the Malcolm X story where you have somebody who's like, you know, doing the wrong thing for a long time. They go to prison, they transform and they get out into the community and and now they're doing the right thing. And they're you know, essentially preaching a certain message that you don't have to do this. You don't have to live this life. Right. And recruiting people into this organization of becoming a violence interrupter. And this goes on. And then after a while, certain people are better than other people at this. Certain people can get through to people more so. And that's why I say you, you remind me of Malcolm X, because there are a lot of Muslims during Malcolm X's time. But he was the one that sort of rose up and people could relate to him more than other people and he had the oratory skills and everything like that and you have developed these relationships with various celebrities and you've brought attention to the organization so i want you just to talk a little bit about about that again from the perspective of somebody listening to this and maybe they're in a similar situation that you were in back when you first got out and they want to they, they're very intent on making the world a better place and using their experience for good. Do you, are celebrities beating down the doors of these organizations or do you have to go out and find these relationships and partnerships? Right. How do you nurture these partnerships? Um, and and okay. how, do, how does that, how does that whole thing happen? Yeah. So I think one of the main things is, Always, I always live by this. Once I, once I start dedicating my life to this, I put my all into it. Like I put my all to when I was doing nonsense, the street stuff. I put my all into it. So once I say I put my all into it, it's like once I change my life. Once I, you know, have some people, you could be somewhere. And I mean, um. People could do this work or do whatever, but some people could have one foot in, one foot out. So I say, no, I'm putting my all into this. So once I start putting this all into this and doing the right thing, so many doors start open up for me and I start meeting people. So Joe King watched the documentary of Interrupters. He sent a tweet out. Say this is a must-see documentary. Everybody need to watch it. I sent a tweet out too. I mean, I tweeted him back. Thank you, Joe King, for watching my movie, right? And he sent a tweet back, Kobe, if I could do anything to help you, let me know. I say, yes. I say, um, yes, let's get together. He said, check your inbox. He sent me his number and all that. And I sent him my number. So I was in New York for to go screen the documentary at the United Nations because we are showing, you know, showing documentaries everywhere. And I see a... Uh, a 646. I'm like, dang. I had not tell nobody I was coming to New York. How they know I'm here? You know, because it'd be a lot of people we work with in a lot of places you can't see all of them when you go. So I don't tell nobody I'm coming, you know, because I can't see everybody. And I don't want nobody being their feelings. I'm talking about in a good way. You know what I'm saying? 
Nothing like that. So I saw that. Who's this six four six? Hello? I said, hello? This Joe King Noah, your boy. I say, hello? Who? This Joe King Noah, your boy. I say, yeah, what's up, Joe? I say, I'm in New York right now. I'm at the United Nations finna screen this movie and all that. He say, oh, you in my backyard, because that's where he grew up at. He said, when you get back, I say, um, it was the weekend. It had to be, I got back Sunday or that Monday. He said, Kobe, you get back Sunday or Monday, let's meet. And we met at PF Change. Bam, we hit it off right there. I wasn't asking him for no money. I wasn't asking him about this. And me and him hit, I say, man, bro. Man, he said, man, he played for the Chicago Bulls. He want to use his platform. And I was saying, I say, Joe, that's great, man. But if you don't be all the way in for real, because I don't want to get involved because these kids been let down all their life. I don't want to get involved. If you don't be all the way in, you're not. And he said, man, I'm locked in with this. I really want to do it. That movie inspired me. We was locked in. That's when the Bulls was playing. Go ahead. Alex, how'd you meet Alex? And why the movie? So I met. And how'd you get him to put cameras in the hood and let these guys get films? I know you. They're paranoid about this. But this go back to relationships. So I met Alex and Steve James. You know who Steve James is? The one who made Hoop Dreams. Alex Collar, which is a bestseller book writer, and all that. I met them. They did a piece on ceasefire at the time in New York Times. That's when I first met them. Then they was bringing them back to do a documentary on cure violence. So a lot of people at the time, they want to get involved because you never know how people are going to show you and all that. And like you say, you couldn't take films that way. It's times I took them with me. People, I mean, put them cameras up. People don't want to get filmed. They want to do that. But you know what I respect about Alex and Steve James and Zach Piper? They say, Kobe, when a documentary is done, anything y'all don't want in there, we'll take out. So they kept their word from the beginning. And um, me and Alex and Joe King and the brother you saw in the member the Hispanic guy, Eddie, was doing, we so close, all of us right now. I mean, I got an event coming up in Chicago. They'll be at and all that, different things. But we do a lot together right now. Did Joe King ever say what inspired him to watch the documentary when he watched it? Yes, because he kept saying he'd been started his Noah's Art Foundation. But he say his assistant, his assistant called him. And Joe was always talking about he want to get involved and all that. And she said, here goes something for you right here. They interrupt us. And he said, that's what did it. And guess what? Right away, he brought 100 copies. And stopped passing out to Derrick Rose. They were all the bulls and everybody. I had so much respect for that guy. Man, that's my brother. That's awesome. And, um, okay, so you you re- did a partnership with him. He followed through, which is something that you were very clear about. If you're going to do this, you have to be all the way in on this. And that obviously brought more eyeballs to what you were doing. And then, so where does it go from there? So now you're you're a part of somebody else's organization, but you're bringing resources into the organization. Are you then tempted to create your own organization, or to start working for Joe's organization, or how do so you Joe how do you organization all is, that? is so Joe King no organization is Noah's Art Foundation, right? Noah's Art, but man, him started the one city, and this under the Noah's Art. But Joe, man, it's like we just do stuff together, man. Me and him went to DOJ to go meet with the Department of Justice. We just we just locked in, and he spent a lot of time in the community. But I respect him because we used to go to the community so much. He ain't never had no security. He used to come by himself. We used to do barbecues, cookout. We used to, he used to give me that, um, hundreds of tickets throughout the year. The brain player, I mean, you know, participants from the community, and he'll come out and talk to him about the game. A lot of these people met Derrick Rose, Jimmy Butler, you know, boys. We started doing a tournament. He started coming out more and just just put events together. And he always on location, you know, always showed up. And uh, early on, we used to, where the boys used to play in Deerfield before they moved this way, the boys, where Jordan was playing, the, the practice in the Burchill Center, we used to take kids out there. So it's like, it's just been a, 
perfect bond with me and my brother, man. That's my guy. Joe King, my guy. Matt Forte, my guy, used to be running back for Chicago Bears. And we just recruited Tony Allen. So he doing a lot and all that. And there's more NBA players been reaching out and want to get involved. And what do they do when they get involved? What does that mean exactly? What are they doing? So in the in the key to all this, we ain't asking nobody for no money. Just come show the kids some love. Just come embrace them. Just show up. Just show up. Come to the tournament. Like we got a leadership worth summit coming up for over 350 kids who played in the one city tournament. And me, Joe, and Tony Allen, his mother gonna sit on the panel. So we got um net coming up and all that. And just really they just come to build up relationships and just talk with them, you know, listen to their stories and all that. And so what's what's the aim of when you guys have these safe street um locations? What is the actual aim? Is it just to keep kids busy to introduce them to no so basketball is just the hook okay. to get them in there so another thing i didn't get a chance to mention mention to you joe king noah went to springfield they gave him two million dollars to do these tournaments and all that so we pay all the kids fifty dollars the coaches money the assistant coaches money everybody a party we keep everything community based but the most important thing basketball is just the hook to get them there but they go through workshops, open short teach them how to financial literacy, open up a bank account, um, how to resolve conflicts without shooting and killing each other, you know, changing mindset, changing behavior. You know, we educate them first. So they go through the workshops, play the best ball, then they get paid. And now they build a relationship so they don't see this guy and all this. So when they see people from different parts of the city now, like, man, I know him from the one city tournament. Let's get him a pass. We ain't going to do nothing to him. You know, we know him now. So you don't got to look at people. Sometimes I know you heard the word op. You ain't got to look at person as an opposition now. Now you see this man. Man, he good people, man. We play an attorney. Man, they beat us last week. We don't try to beat the other team next week. We want to, you know, and all that. But know what I love about what I always hear like is this. Like, a lot of these young people say, man, we got to go in the house early Friday because I'm ready for that basketball game Saturday. And we provide food for them and just everything. So it'd it be a great thing. And guess what? Joe King show up and really show him love. Other people show up and show him love. And we finna start taking some of these kids to Africa and different things like that, bring some kids to Africa over there, over here. So it's just... Just trying to do our part, man, to get back to the community. Yeah, I saw on your Instagram, you guys, you guys went to some. Where'd you go again? It was like some foreign country. Rwanda. We went to Rwanda. Yeah, 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 yeah. What was that about? Yeah, me and Joe. I mean, we was going there and um, met with the some of the NBA people there and all that because you know Joe, he invested over there in NBA Africa now. I mean, um, NBA BAL Black Africa League. He over there and um. Uh, want to just keep the relationships close where we could uh, do things together. So it was a good trip. It's a learning trip. We went to Rwanda where the genocide, genocide happened at and all that. So that was, uh, it's a mind blowing, man. You know, uh, thousands, of, hundreds of thousands of people got killed. And man, it was crazy. Speaking of international conflict, right? Ceasefire has become a really big term now with what's going on in the Middle East, but you've been screaming ceasefire, ceasefire. We've been we've been doing this for 20, 20 years. Yeah. 20 years. And if someone told you 20, 25 years ago, Kobe, that you were going to have a book out, that your book was going to come out in 2024, July 2nd, and it was going to detail the whole story, and it was going to be, you know, written with, with Joey and Joey G and and Josh G. Josh G and Joe. And, yeah. Uh, what would you have thought if knowing that you're gonna have a book out? Your first book. Man, that's that's crazy you saying that, but man, I didn't never think like that. You know what I'm saying? Like I say, me and Josh G been talking about it for a while. And um uh, Josh G, um, he is the communication director, you know what I'm saying, for cure violence, is siege fighting at the time. So Josh 
is the one who helped get the Interrupters documentary out there. He the one really, when I say get out there, the communication, to the put it out there in different places and all that. And we always, man, him was always talking about the book and talking about we want to, we we want to get a book out there and different things like that. But man, it took a lot of work. We'll start, we'll stop it. You know what I'm saying? And all that, but to see it really happening, you're right. I don't, man, I, I ain't never saw this coming. No, I, I, I bet. I ain't never, you know, the people I met on the journey of this work and all that, I ain't never seen none of this like this, man. Like I say, it's truly a blessing, but Man, Alice Conowitz, a number one best book, a bookseller, got a big name. He did a foyer for me. My brother Joe King Noah did a foyer. You know what I'm saying? I never, it's, it is when I think about it, it's mind blowing. You know what I'm saying? It's like, man, this is real. And I ain't never see me traveling all over the world like this, doing this violence prevention work. People, you say, oh, Kobe, you ain't going to live to see 18. You ain't going to see this. You follow your father's footsteps. I would never tell no kid they ain't going to live to see 18. I would never tell nobody they wouldn't do this and do that. But, man, I sit back, man, and uh, I lost my mother a few years ago, and my brother, and my mom and brother used to always tell me, Kobe, man, my mom used to say, I love you. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. She used to tell me that, and my brother, I, man, I just fight with it sometimes that I ain't get no chance to really interview my mama. You know what I'm saying? And while we was writing a book, she is still alive. You know what I'm saying? And jumping on the phone, but you know, that real sit down. And I talked to my grandmother about that. That's the only thing kind of bothered me a lot. Like, but, but I'm glad to see she saw me get my life together though. You know what I'm saying? My grandfather, my brother, my uncle and them and all that, because they know the struggle I've been through in life, period. But to see me get it right, man, thank God for really, man, for um, letting them see that, though, for real. So the book is extremely detailed. I mean, you have conversation after conversation of things that happened, you know, many, many years ago. And obviously, when you write with Josh, when you write with anyone, a lot of that involves interviewing and talking about the past and conjuring up yeah. old memories. How was that process for you? Like what, what was it cathartic to sort of replay all of these different moments, these different scenes in your life? And how did it, how did it transform you when you got to the end of that? Because I'm sure it was a very laborious process having to remember all of that in so much detail. Yeah, so it was um to remember things, and I ain't gonna lie. Early on, I kept going back and forth, right? How much, how much I want to share, you know, you know what I'm saying? So I kept going back and forth, like, man, do I want to share this? Take this out, take this out. Then I kept saying, man, this is my story, and I always want my story just to inspire somebody else who probably went through what I went through or going through what I went through. I just want to touch somebody. Because I remember when the documentary, The Interrupters, came out, and so many people saying it touched them, and I saw people literally break down and cry to me. You know, man, you my hero. You really touched me, and um, you really motivate me want to do more. You, you, you helped me forgive people who I thought was my enemy. You know what I'm saying? And different things like that. So it's all about really just trying to use my voice to just help out, you know, what, anywhere what I can. What was the concern? What, what, you know, why wouldn't you want to include things? My life, family, friends, or whatever, even growing up, we always was taught not to say much. You know what I'm saying? So not to say much. So I'm saying I changed my life. I'm saying I'm doing the right thing. I ain't doing that crazy, but it was like how much I want to go, you know what I'm saying? Deep into this and that and share. 
But it was nothing like you weren't concerned about revealing any illegal things that other people were involved. No, it wasn't that because I know I ain't gonna say <laughs> do I ain't gonna say this that could be incredible to anybody. You know what I'm saying? I ain't gonna do stuff like say nothing mm-hmm. like that, but it's just like um how much I want to share, how much I don't. So it, it, it really caused you to have to be vulnerable then going through that process. Man, a, a lot. Yeah. Cause it was, yeah, it was tough. It was tough at times. Has it been, has it been option it yet tough. for a film? No, but I hope you <laughs> help me get it out there to, to get one. <laughs> Let's get it out there. Let's, Let's get it go. out there. Guide me in the right direction. So <laughs> you have go. a you have a yeah. tour planned. Has the tour started yet? No, uh, uh-uh, but I got a lot of stuff coming. Uh, well, Chicago will do some things before the second. I'm gonna do something on the second in Miami. Joe King gonna do some the following week. Um, we got basketball championships coming up. We on honor that. Um, we got leadership summit, so we got some things just, you know, coming up. We still trying to figure things out. My goal is, they say I need five thousand copies sold to make the bestseller list. So I'm trying to get it out there. So I'm working, man. I'm working. Whatever it do, I mean, I love being on the bestseller, but whatever God got playing, got playing. I just want to use the story to help. What do you want? Else. What are some of the the things you want people to take away from reading your story? I always say this. I want people to know it ain't how you start. It's how you finish. I want people to know redemption is real, man. You could come back. You could redeem yourself. I want people to know skills to what we do. So I want to educate people's skills when you're doing mediation, conflict resolution. It's special skills. I want people to know that even though the news and everybody might not share it all the time, but we really save lives out here. We really make a difference. We really have paid people change their mass and their thinking. And I just want people to know you're not alone. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback. And back to the show. Arguably, though, the kids who are on the street now are probably not reading a lot of books. So is this book written for them? Is it written for other people who could reach them? Who, who's your audience that you have in mind? I want to reach everybody, right? Everybody is my audience. But kids might not be reading a book, but guess what? They see them at these tournaments because we talking to them. We're doing workshops with them. We educating them. We explaining things to them and all that. And we being there for them. How old are Quinn and Latrell now? So, you know, I got four kids. So Quinn and Latrell are old now. They like 28, two of them and one of 27. I got a daughter, 20, 23 years old. So I got all big kids now. And what do they think about dad and his his history? Oh, they, and, they, and they happy. They, ha- they happy. They happy. Yeah. They really happy. And they see the consistent it consistency. I've been I've been on it. And this times I remember back then when I used to I first started, they used to say, Man, Dad, can we talk about something else? We tied in about sea trial. Let's talk about something else. You told a story in your TED talk about your son. About my son? Yeah. About the mediation. Exactly. Yeah. Can you yeah. Share that, share that story. Yeah. So it was crazy. So uh, you know. Got a son who stayed in trouble a little more than others. I would say that. And uh, the school kept calling. And I said, like, man, what this man do now? Because they calling for him, him only. They calling, calling. I say, man, what's that? Hello? Yeah. We just want to share something with you. I said, all right, lay it on me. It's a big brawl. People was fighting and gathering and this and that and coming at each other. Dre jumped in the middle of it and de-escalated. He stopped them. He talked them down and he doing this and he doing that. So I was so happy to hear that. I was, you know, so when he came home, he said, did the school call? 
I'm trying to act like I'm here. No, they ain't call. I think they call. You know, I'm just playing it all. But he is so angry. He say, man, the school going to call, Dad. It's good, though. All right, man, ain't good. But I did talk to him already. So I'm just messing with him. And he is like, man, the school, they don't call. I say, so what happened? Man, there's clowning up there, and I intervened at. I said, yeah, the school called me, man. I'm proud of you. So he said, Dad, this year I'm going to get 10 mediations. So anytime we do a mediation, we document it. We got to perform. So I say, you did that mediation? Hey, follow, huh? document this. You, we want to track this. He said he don't get 10. I think he ain't getting no more mediation, but he still got that one, and I still got it. So that was happy that he thought of me in that situation because he know that's what I do every day. And a lot of times when I was going uh, going to work, when he was suspended or something, he was going with me. So he know everybody in the office and all that. So he see the stuff we used to do in real time, though. So that made me feel proud. That made me proud, though. Are you still going to mediate in person or are you mostly training? Oh, I, people? I people. do a lot of training and help open up this programs all over, but once you do it, you don't stop because it's sometimes the personal relationships you have with people, people want you to come in because of the relationship. So I still do it the time to time. And then finally, what did, what would you say is your definition of success? Having seen everything you've seen and done everything you've done, how, how are you viewing that for yourself and, and for maybe young people? I see success, man. When I see a lot of brothers, sisters, been in the community and they've been involved with everything under the sun, right? I mean, bang and they doing this and doing that and see where they at now. It's times like we have these people get jobs. We see people went back to school. You know, we see people relocated a lot of times. So I, a lot of things. We see people who are out there now, they doing this work now. They, that's a lot of people when, when I was doing it, the street part, now they doing the street part. So we deputized them to do the work. So, and, and to see them, how they um changing their thing, how they change their mindset and they own it and um bringing people together and remaining neutral, not taking sides and different things like that. It's a wonderful thing, man. Beautiful, man. Yes. Well, look, I, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story and putting out this body of work into the world. And obviously it's, it's hit a chord in a positive way with a lot of people. And I'm hoping to continue spreading that message and, and get more eyeballs and, and more people clicking through and looking at the stuff that you guys are doing. So if someone lives in a different part of the world and they want to support, contribute, is, what are some of the best ways to do that? I would tell people, they see this, interruptiveviolence.com. They could go on the website and different things like that. And locally, if some people want to get involved in a city or different things like that, they could just look up a lot of this is CVI work, right? Community violence intervention work. And it's a lot of local offices in different, different places like that. Or they could go on cvg.org, our website, cvg.org, and learn more and reach out and whatever. How many offices are there today? So it's like 50 some, but okay. it's changed every other day. Then we got a lot of stuff international. Mm -hmm. So most but of it's a lot of CVI movement. Yeah. Oh yeah. In the, in a lot of CVI sites, hundreds, hundreds all over though. And that they take on volunteers. People can go in there and, and volunteer. Yeah. And learn to work and do stuff like that and help out with community events and different right. things like that. Yeah. And are there fundraisers? Do, do, do they accept donations? People oh, yeah. They it? accept a lot of donations. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. Awesome. But man. spread this word, interruptviolence.com. We need to you're, get it out there. You're on the keynote speaking scene too, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Hopefully we'll get a chance to cross paths yes. during that as well. All right, man. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Okay. I'm inspired. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm imagining the book is going to be available everywhere books are sold. Yes. And, uh, and I want everybody to get a copy of this book and, and thank you.
and dive into a slice of your life. So thank you so much, man. And thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day. So make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.